morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Let's start with a word of prayer. Our Father, thank you so much for gathering us together this morning to study your word. Uh, Father, we want to just bear witness that in this terrible world of things going wrong, you're always right. Thank you, Jesus. And we just pray that you're with us this morning and open our minds and our understandings to the things of your word. In Jesus' Christ's name, amen. amen. Well, as you know, I like to share scripture from a Jewish perspective and uh, talk about the uh, Jewishness of our faith. And what I want to talk about tomorrow, this morning is an area of scripture that I know you know about. You know it very well. It's a very intimate part of your walk as being a Christian. And you probably think it's one of the least Jewish things I could share about. And that's being born again. Being born again is only mentioned in two places in Scripture. The first place is the interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus in John uh, chapter 3, the first 10 verses. And the other is uh, one little verse in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. So let me start by reading about the interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus in John uh, chapter 3. And it says this, does a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and he said unto him, Rabbi, you know that you are the teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say you must be born again. The wind blows where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it comes and whither it goes, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? You would think that being born again is probably the most churchy thing that you could say to a Jewish person if you're trying to share the witness of, of, of uh, the gospel. You would think it would be an instant source of offense. But where did Jesus get this being born again thing from anyway? Why was Nicodemus surprised but not shocked by it if this was a new teaching? I want to go through these first 10 verses and I want to dissect them one at a time. Verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So what do we learn about Nicodemus here? We learn, number one, that he's a Pharisee. Now Pharisees, their responsibility was to add to the to Mishnah, to, to the, uh, the written uh, part of Talmud, and explaining the oral law from memory. Also teaching Talmud, uh, teaching Torah. Needless to say, these were very smart guys. These were no dummies. And John calls him, and Jesus calls him, a ruler of the Jews. The term of ruler of the Jews was reserved for members of the Sanhedrin, the, the ruling council on Israel. Verse 2. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Why did Nicodemus come by night? Well, the, the Pharisees and Jesus were at odds with each other. The Pharisees believed that Jesus was a false teacher, that Jesus was a heretic, that Jesus was a bad dude. So Nicodemus didn't want to be seen with him. 
So he came at night so nobody could see him. And then Nicodemus goes on to acknowledge that he came from God and that he performs miracles. He's acknowledging his messiahship. Nicodemus at this point in time may not have been a believer, but he was way on his way to being a believer. Verse 3. Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus, and he's, he's, he's doing all these accolades and platitudes, but Jesus is a man of uh, short words, and he just gets right to the point. And he says, a man must be born again to see or understand the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4. Nicodemus says unto him, how can a man be born when he's old? How can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus is confused. He says, how can a man be born when he's old? Is he saying, how can you be born again after you've already been born physically with water? Or is he saying you need something else? Keep that in the back of your mind. Verse 5. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say to thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus explains you've got to be born of water, which is physical birth. You have to be born through your three mother. But it is also, you must be born of a spirit, spiritual birth, to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 6, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So Jesus confirms there are two types of birth, there's physical birth and there's spiritual birth. Verse 7, marvel not that I said you must be born again. Jesus tells Nicodemus, don't be surprised when I tell you you still need to be born again. Verse 8, the wind blows where it lifts us, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but thou canst not tell whether where it comes and whether it goes, such as that is one, so it so is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Spiritual birth is not so, is, is, spiritual birth is something that's not physical. It's not something you can see and touch. Verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said, How can these things be? So Nicodemus is still confused. He says, How can these things be? And in verse 10, Nicodemus, uh, I'm sorry, Jesus answered and said unto him, but thou art master of Israel, and knowest not these things. Jesus takes Nicodemus to task. He says, how can these things be? Are you a master of Israel, and you know not these things? You should have known them. This is not a new teaching. So why was Nicodemus confused? What was his real problem? What should he have known? Under rabbinic theology, there are six ways of being born again. This is not a new teaching. Nicodemus qualified for two of the six ways. He did not qualify, uh, he, he did qualify for four of the six ways. The six ways to be born again under rabbinic theology are these. First way is when a Gentile is converted to Judaism. You're said to be born again. There's nothing in scripture to indicate that Nicodemus was ever a Gentile or ever converted to Judaism. So Nicodemus did not qualify for that. The second way is when you're crowned king of Israel. Again, there's nothing in scripture to indicate that Nicodemus was ever crowned king of Israel. So he didn't qualify for that either. So that leaves us four, four more ways of being born again. The first way was when a, when a Jew was about mitzvah at age 13. He became subservient to the law. 
We know that Nicodemus was a Jew who followed the law. So we know he was bar mitzvah at age 13. He did qualify. So he was said to be born again when he had his bar mitzvah. The second way to be born again is when you got married. Now, how do we know Nicodemus was married? To be married, a member of the Sanhedrin, you had to be married. And if you remember in verse 1, Jesus referred to him as a ruler of the Jews, the terminology reserved to members of the Sanhedrin. So we know that Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin, therefore he was married, and he did qualify to be born again under, this, uh, under these circumstances. The next way to be ordained, uh, to be uh, considered born again, was when you were ordained a rabbi. How do we know Nicodemus was a rabbi? He was a Pharisee. Pharisees had to be ordained rabbis. Therefore, Nicodemus was an ordained rabbi, and he was said to be born again when he became a rabbi. Finally, he was said you could be born again when you became the head of the yeshiva, the rabbinic uh, seminary. Anyone who was the head of a rabbinic seminary was given the title, the Master of Israel. In verse 10, we read where Jesus refers to Nicodemus as the Master of Israel. So he qualified. He usually took, this took place around age 50. So he was born again four out of the six ways that he knew how. So being born physically and spiritually takes place when we're indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God. This comes to pass after we come to believe and we follow Yeshua and Jesus. In Romans 8 9, we read this. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And, be, and, and so be in the spirit, God dwells in you. Now, if any man has not the spirit, he's none of these. Compare that to verse 5 for the, in, in, in John. It says, Very verily, amen, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. It's saying the same thing, the same verse. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says this, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? Again, compare that to verse 5. Saying the same thing. This is not a new teaching. So what is the purpose of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God? What's the Spirit's job? Why is he there? This is spelled out beautifully in John chapter 16, verse 13. And it says this, the spirit of truth guides us in all truth. I'm sorry, I read the wrong verse. How be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you in all truth. He will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he hears, that shall he speak. And, and he will show you things to come. So the spirit of truth guides us in all truth. He allows us to tell the difference between truth and lie. How? How does he do this? He does this through the word of God, through the gift of discernment. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, we read, But the natural man receives not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. How many times have you tried sharing the word of God with an unbeliever, and you lay out all the facts, all, all the truths in scripture, in such a logical, clear way, they're so obvious, and that person will look at you and say, I don't get it, I don't see it, I don't believe it. It's because they don't have spiritual discernment because they don't have the enjoyable of the Spirit of God. God draws us to open our understanding to his word. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, it says this. No, I'm sorry. 
chapter in John chapter 6, 44. You gotta forgive me, but my glasses are by fault, but all the numbers jump around me. It says, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent him, draw him. He sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up in the last day. So God draws us to the Son, to the truth of the scripture by opening our understanding, by giving us gift of discernment so we can understand what the scriptures actually say. It's, it's like a, a, a progressive thing going on there. We hear the word, God opens our understanding, and then we, we come to uh, be saved and get the enrolling Holy Spirit. Then he says, he speaks what he hears. He communicates between the Father and you. He lets you know what the Father wants to say to you. It, it, it's just a marvelous phenomenon. And then he says, he, he, shows, he shows us things to come. He opens up the word of prophecy to us. He allows us to understand the things that will come. The un unbelievers, this is nonsense. You start talking about prophecy to people who are unbelievers, and they look at you like they have three heads. <laughs> they don't have the spirit of discernment. They don't understand what you're talking about. Then it says, he seals us. Whoever had, this is uh, 1 Corinthians 1 22. It says, For whoever had sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our heart, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit seals us. It forms a bond between us and God. Sealing is a sign of ownership. We now belong to God. God owns us. We are set aside or sanctified for God's purpose, and nothing can ever break that bond. Nothing can ever break that bond. Once you are sealed by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you, nothing can ever change that. You can't change that. You can't believe something and then unbelieve it. You may understand something with the head knowledge, but when you honestly believe it, then it becomes part of you. Nothing ever changes that. And finally, we told that the Holy Spirit makes us a new creature. Now, some of you may have an argument with your spouse, and you thought, this is such a creature. This is different. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Physical, life, physical birth brings new physical life. Spiritual birth, being born again, brings us new spiritual life. It's different than the old life. You become a new creature. These are the reasons to be indwelling the Holy Spirit. So, when does the Holy Spirit indwell us? Some churches teach that, well, when you speak in tongues, you, you, you get the Holy Spirit. Some teach that there's a special uh, baptism to receive the Holy Spirit. And other mishapas, this is, this is nonsense. Yeah. Ephesians 1.13 spells it out beautifully. It says, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So here's the progression. First thing is you hear the word of God. Someone shares the word of God with you. You trust what they tell you. Then you believe it. These are the requirements for salvation. And in John 3.16, this is to all that believe. You hear the word, you trust the word, and you believe the word. And then you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. You're forever indwelled with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is telling Nicodemus, you were born the first time in physical birth to be your mom. You were born again every way possible under Pharisee theology. Every way that you were taught as a Jew, as a Pharisee, as a member of the Sanhedrin, you fulfilled all that. So his real question is, if all that, how can I still be born again? 
Jesus is saying, what you haven't done is be born again by believing in me and receiving the indwelling Holy Spirit. See, the other things don't, don't produce the indwelling Holy Spirit. Only believing in Jesus produces the Spirit to come and dwell inside you. The spiritual rebirth. That's what was missing. And then he says, this is what was missing. And, and, and this is, you say you are the master of Israel. You should have known this. Nicodemus should have known this. But he didn't know this. Being born again is actually a Jewish practice. And it goes all the way back to receiving Jesus. It's the most Jewish thing that a Jew could do, is to be born again. And judging by scripture, Nicodemus did come to faith and believe in Yeshua as his Lord and Savior. I like to share on the Jewish roots of our faith, the Jewish evangelism, Israel, and Bible prophecy, and they're all intertwined. They're all integral parts of each other. The current events taking place today on the world stage are very prophetic and affect all of our lives. Big prophetic things are happening on that world stage right now as we see. We see them, but unbelievers, those who have no spiritual discernment, have no clue what's going on. <clears throat> Things are moving very, very fast. God willing, I'm going to be off in that direction in, in the coming future. But just like in the days of Noah, until the rain fell, people out there have no clue. These are exciting times for us believers and can be frightening if your focus is not on the things of God and Messiah Jesus, who's coming to take us all home very soon. <clears throat> Any questions? Oh, come on, someone's got another question. <laughs> yes, sir. I have a comment. I found, not because I found, but because the scripture says it, is that when we speak to someone about the Lord, we make a mistake when we don't use scripture. You need to quote scripture because it's just our words and what really, if anything is going to click, it's going to be the Bible. We really need to read, you know, this is not just what I say. Let me read you this scripture because the scripture is the word of God. That's where, and it's hard to lead someone to the Lord without reading, and we think we can do it without the, the word. I remember when I came to faith, about August 15th, 1974, and I went to a home Bible study in the basement of this couple that we know. And it was being taught by a, uh, a woman who's with the American Board of Missions to the Jews, and uh, she came from a Messianic background. And I went there with the understanding that there were Jews there teaching about Jesus and I went there to disprove, disprove them and, and to show what kind of heretics these people. Meanwhile, I had never seen a Bible in my life. I knew nothing about scripture. I'd never even opened the Bible. And I walked into that room and on the other side of the room, there's probably 50 people there, 70 people, there's a lot of people. There's a short, fat little Jewish woman and she looks across the room, she looks right into my eyes and she comes running across the room she plants a big white kiss on my cheek and says, Darling, do you know Jesus? Says, sit down. I sat down and she proceeded to give me the gospel. She opened up the scriptures. She read John 3, 16. I had never seen a Bible in my life, but I knew instantly that what she was telling me was the truth. Amen. And I trusted that what I was hearing was the truth. And I got saved that very instant. And it's like... I forgot how many years, but it's a lot of years. That's a testimony to what, the, what God can do when he calls you and he opens your understanding. We can preach scripture to people day and night, but unless God calls them, they're not going to understand a word we're saying. Any more questions? Yes. Hi. So on the flip side of that, I had a much different conversion experience. It was not instantaneous. I was presented with the gospel and I mulled 
it over and I kicked and screamed against it for probably months before I read Isaiah 53 and it changed my heart by, by reading that scripture. So I think sometimes, you know, God works differently in different, different people. And I believe God is calling everybody. And Satan is working overtime, mm -hmm. as it says in Corinthians, mm -hmm. to blind us, yeah. to keep us from being saved through his, you know, his various schemes, whatever. And I think it's important just to, um, to realize that God wants everybody to be saved. And what, when he goes into your soul with the Holy Spirit, it's because you've said to the Lord, yeah. I'm willing to listen right now. And I think that's when that perfect storm happens of you saying to God, being coming to him humbly, and him saying, okay, here it is. And that's when the light bulb goes on. I agree with you 100%. I had a Jewish neighbor, and uh, many people had witnessed to her. And she was on the fence for a long time. And I met her at a diner one time, and I sat and I shared the word of God with her. I shared the same thing, Isaiah 53. And she said, i never seen that before. Is that the Jewish Bible? Said, yeah. You sure that's not in the New Testament? No, that's the Jewish Bible. And she, her, her, her jaw dropped, and, and she read it again, and she came to faith in that, that very instant. She she, right now, she moved to Israel, she's working with Christians over Israel. Okay. But she, she had been witnessed to many, many times, and she mulled it over in her thoughts and her minds and considered it. But for some reason, at that instant, God opened her understanding to it. That's how God works. Faith comes by hearing and hearing, hearing by the word of God. Of God. Amen. Anyone else? I, 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 was I have a, I've just been trying to change uh, how I share the gospel with people. And it's taken all these years to refine this and to realize what's wrong and what's right. And uh, I've really changed on how I present the gospel. Uh, going away from ask Jesus into your heart because that's nowhere in the scripture, ask exactly. Jesus into your heart. Mm -hmm. I don't know where yeah. God came up with that, mm -hmm. uh, that you're going to be saved. And I've been working with this one lady uh, who, uh, and, you know, going through a hard time, and I told her about God. And, and what I said, and I've been saying this to multiple people now, unbelievers, you know what? The Bible says if we seek God with all of our hearts, you're going to find him. So this is what the Word of God says. Okay, this is what you need to do. Seek truth. If you seek truth, you're going to end up with Jesus. That's where it's going to come full circle. And I want you to just pray. And I've done it with multiple people. Just, you know, I'm not going to tell you what to do. There's no, this whole idea of you say this prayer and then you're saved has been the biggest fallacy because I know tons of people and I, I, mm -hmm. I shared it Wednesday night, you know, uh, every VBS, we go through this whole thing for years and years. You go into the room and you, and how many kids want, and who wants Jesus in their heart? I do, I do. And we go, great. And we celebrate, we tell the parents, your kids are good to go. And the kids go, go to a life of crime, but the parents will go, yeah, but in VBS, they said they asked Jesus into their heart. Well, where's that the gospel? It's not. And, and we have just... You know, and we're all like, yes, look at how many people, 30, 40 people got saved. No one got saved. Mm -hmm. Not a single one. And with this one particular lady, I, I was just amazed. I met with her again, and she's totally saved, and I didn't lead her to salvation. I led it to the truth, mm -hmm. and I could tell when she came back the second time, I said, something's happened to you. She goes, I don't, my kids are going, what happened to you, Mom? She goes, I, I'm just... I just, I've never been so happy. I have this peace in my heart. I said, well, what did you do? And she goes, I just, you know, I, I read. Uh, I just started talking to God and, and understanding. And, and I, I made sure, you know, you understand the cross, sins, atonement, repentance. We're not good enough. She understood. 
And there was never a like, let's bow our heads and ask Jesus into our heart. I've been doing that for so long, and I've been so convicted that that is not the right thing to do. Because people go, okay, I said the prayer, okay, now fix my problems. And those people never got saved, and I believe they were getting saved. And I led them to believe they were getting saved. And what a, what a great deception where it is God who does the salvation, does the saving, not me. And not, you know, you just say A, B, C, D, you check these boxes, you're ready to go. I and agree with you 100%. Uh, John 3.16 says we, come, we, come, we get saved when we believe. Yeah. Saying the prayer, if you're saying that prayer, hopefully you already believe already. Yeah. Uh, when I share the gospel, I share the truth, I share the, I share the facts, then I leave it up to God to open their understanding to it. You had a question? You said exactly what I wanted to say. You've got to make a commitment. You've got to ask Jesus into your heart, believing that he's going to come into your heart, and believing that you're going to be changed. And if you just ask him into your heart, it's mouth, word of mouth. Mm -hmm. You need a commitment. Yeah, I mean, it, it reminds me of Romans, I think it's Romans 10, 16. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. I mean, it's not just making a, a verbal profession. you got to believe, believe the gospel. It. Yep. And it's, you know, we, we will, on one hand, we want to say it's simple. A child can do it. But on the other hand, you have to acknowledge the facts and what Jesus did on the cross. So there's, I don't know, I guess there's a balance there. Yeah. Anyone else? My, my wife was brought up as a Roman Catholic, yeah. and she was at church. Uh, mm -hmm. Whenever it is, they do the Stations of the Cross thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, this happened, and, and, and somehow it touched her heart. And she knew that everything that I had been sharing with her about Scripture was true. And she never went back again. She came, she came to faith that night. But God can use any circumstance to open your understanding. But it all stems from the Word of God. Yes. I think sometimes when we're um, witnessing to people, I'm sure I can. But sometimes when we're witnessing to people, we want them so much to know Jesus, rather than just letting God and the Holy Spirit work on them. Because you know we have to do our part, and then, you know, like you said, have God work on them and the Holy Spirit work on them. Because we just can't force it to happen. You know, especially with family, we want them to be saved. We want to just like kind of shake them. Like, Understand, you know, but you have to come in a loving way because we were once there as well. But people used to come up to me when I was in college. Do you want to be saved? I'm like, Are you crazy? You know, you know, so we have to remember where we came from too, and you know, be a little more forgiving and loving. Actually, nobody in my family is a believer. On my wife's side, on my side, but we, we have faith that God will open our understanding to things we've been saying to them for so many years. And in God's time, that'll happen. God will. Anyone else? Yeah, Basically. I wanted to add, you know, now that we're on this, this vein here, again, it's been so convicting. I mean, so many times I have people in my office, and I would say, listen, before you go, for me, just say this prayer, okay? <laughs> and, and, and you like, you twist their arm, okay? Okay, I believe in Jesus Christ, I'm on the cross, blah, 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 blah. Okay, and she's in my heart. I say, great, that's all I wanted you to do. So I feel like, I did my thing, you're good to go now. And it's like, I mean, it, it, I look back and I look, that was just, nothing happened. Yeah. Nothing happened because all they were, were doing, you know, I remember I actually had the prayer written out. And I'm not saying that that can't change people, but many people will come back. So how many times do I have to say this prayer? <laughs> because they think, you know, they, they're so used to reciting the Our Father and the Hail Mary. They think it's just something that you do when you're in trouble. You say these words, and it's like, no, no, you don't understand. And, and that's true. They didn't understand. And it's just such a thing because you want to put a notch in your belt. Well, I led that person to the Lord. And God said, you didn't leave nobody in anything. Okay? And, and that's the whole problem with thinking that I got somebody saved tonight. Okay? I, I got them saved. You no, know, we don't save people. You know, we bring them to the truth. And say, here it is. This is, you know, door number one or door number two. What are you going to do about Jesus at the end of the day? Who is he going to be to you? And just present those questions. And that's what Jesus would do a lot. 
you know, he would just say, oh, this is what it is. Okay, what are you going to do? Okay, with this truth now. Okay, like even with Nicodemus, he didn't say, okay, now, Nicodemus, where are you are? Follow me in this prayer. Okay, and, you know, he goes, this is what it is. And so Nicodemus had to think about those things. Yeah. You know, Nicodemus came to him with all these accolades and platitudes. And Jesus is right to the point. He cuts to the chase. You got to be born again. He gives them the facts. He gives them the gospel, yeah. and and that's what that, I think that's the the most direct way of doing. Give people the facts, then leave it up to God to, to work in their hearts. Anyone else? Last chance. Going once. Going twice. God bless you all. This is uh, closer to word of prayer. Brian. Yeah. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being here with us this morning for opening our understandings and some new things about this concept of being born again father let us keep that in our mind when we share the gospel with people especially jewish people father we know that you call them and you call them through your word father use us as the instruments of your calling and we just thank you so much father and we look forward to the service this morning thank you father in jesus precious name amen, amen.